Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Senator Carper, uh, Senator uh, Sass, Senator Ernst. I'm very pleased to be here to talk about our 2015 uh, report. Uh, in this report, as Chairman, you mentioned, it's our fifth in the series, we identify uh, 24 new areas that have 66 recommendations for actions uh, going forward to either reduce elimination overlap and duplication, fragmentation in the federal government, or achieve cost savings or enhance revenues. Uh, just a few quick examples from the report. First, uh, in looking at oversight of consumer safety, uh, we found a patchwork approach has developed over the years where there are at least 20 different agencies involved in some aspect of consumer protection. We found the system to be fragmented and having overlapping jurisdictions. We're recommending that the Congress take action to establish a formal coordinating mechanism uh, for oversight of consumer uh, protection. Uh, we think this will result in very uh, much inefficiencies being dealt with and a more efficient system, and importantly, a better protection for the American public because it eliminate regulatory gaps in consumer protection issues. Uh, in the area of non-emergency medical transportation, these are for people that are, uh, because of their age, disabled, or uh, their income uh, constraints that they may have, they're not able to get to medical appointments, so agencies provide rides. We found 42 different programs at six different agencies providing these services and not a lot of coordination going on. Here there is a coordinating council, but it hasn't met since 2008. Uh, also, when we went to look at the local levels where there's coordination going on at the state and local level, two big federal players aren't really playing that much as they should be, and that's the Medicaid program and the Veterans Administration program. So there's a lot of opportunities for cost sharing, cost riding, achieving greater efficiencies. And this is very important uh, because of our aging population as it continues to grow. This is an area where the federal government uh, can achieve a lot more efficiencies and get people uh, the needed medical treatment that, that they need. Uh, also, we found in looking at the defense health system area, really a, a, syst a small system within the larger system. It was set up in uh, the 1980s when some of the public health uh, organizations were transferred and they were given responsibility for providing health care to defense uh, families and retired annuitants and they were given uh, special status in legislation. Well, in the 90s, TRICARE came around. We now have a TRICARE managed care system throughout the United States and all coverage and really this uh, system is called the uh, DOD Family Health System is providing the same services to the same people who are getting TRICARE services in the same areas of the country. So we think with a carefully crafted transition to protect the beneficiaries, millions of dollars can be saved in administrative costs and savings uh, to uh, DOD. Another area we point out is the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Uh, this was set up following the oil embargoes in the 1970s so that we have a supply, emergency supply of oil uh, should uh, we need it given disruptions that might occur in the provision of, of oil from abroad. Uh, but as U.S. productions increase, we're now at record levels of production. Uh, there's uh, plenty of reserves, not only in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but in private sector reserves and we're far in excess of international requirements for the reserves. We think DOD, DOE should re-examine the need for the size of this reserve. And we think if it uh, uh, comes out the way we think it would be, there may be the potential to reap billions of dollars in savings from what's in the reserve, reduce dramatically the administrative costs uh, to keep the reserve operating, and also its infrastructure is in need of of repair and replacement so that they may have to do it at a less level if you don't have the same size of reserve. Also in uh, cancer hospitals that were set up in the 1980s when most cancer treatments were provided in the hospital versus outpatient care, a special uh, system was set up to pay these hospitals at their cost as opposed, as opposed to the prospective payment system of negotiated costs under fee-for-service. 
Uh, given tran uh, cancer treatments have uh, evolved over the years, and most people are receiving it in outpatient services, we compared uh, this old system to the new system that's been modernized. And Phil, if the, these hospitals were treated the same as other teaching hospitals that provide cancer treatments, you know, recognizing uh, we compared the, uh, the uh, cancer uh, status of the patients, uh, the federal government could re reduce costs by $500 million a year and putting them on a more equitable basis. Now, with regard to areas that we've identified in the past, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, there were 440 areas, 39 uh, percent or were partially addressed, 20 percent haven't been addressed at all, and 37 percent have been uh, fully addressed. And both of you have cited uh, the savings that's resulted, uh, $20 billion so far and about another $80 billion in the works that will be saved uh, as a result of actions taken but there's plenty of money still left on the table uh, to be addressed in these areas. A couple government-wide issues that I've talked with uh, this committee before about, I'd reiterate again, one is strategic sourcing across the federal government. Most of the private sector entities that we uh, uh, studied uh, have most of their spending, about 90 percent of it, under strategic sourcing where they examine whether they can consolidate providers, use their buying power to leverage better costs uh, at the local level. The federal government, last time we looked at, only had about 5 percent of its uh, procurement spending uh, under strategic sourcing. We think this has enormous potential. Even 1 percent reduction would result in $4 billion uh, savings. Uh, OMB has taken some actions in this regard, but not yet set metrics or goals to achieve. So we think the Congress's intervention in this uh, area would be helpful. Information technology acquisitions, I was here uh, before this committee in February talking about the adding to our high-risk list of IT acquisitions and operations. Uh, Senator Carper, you mentioned the Federal Information Technology Reform Act. That holds a lot of promise if effectively implemented for billions of dollars in savings. And so I would uh, continue to urge this committee to have active oversight over IT spending. Uh, many savings can occur and, and reduce reduction and wasteful spendings in this in this area uh, can occur o over time. Also at DOD, we point out uh, continued uh, activities that could result in reducing their overhead costs, reducing some of their health care costs, and reducing the cost of acquiring weapon systems uh, through implementation of our recommendations. We also have a number of recommendations. Uh, in the Medicare and Medicaid areas and healthcare spending where there's an opportunity to uh, revamp some of the payment policies that would save billions of dollars and to provide greater oversight over activities, particularly at the state level in the Medicaid program where tens of billions of dollars are being approved in demonstration projects that really don't have congressional oversight and in our view are not budget neutral and really cost the government more money. And of course I've talked about the problem with improper payments in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. We reiterate in our report uh, the number of recommendations we have to reduce uh, those uh, improper payments. Last year in Medicare was uh, $60 billion, Medicaid $17 billion. Uh, we also have recommendations for a uh, number of areas for benefit offsets that would be more appropriate in accordance with the law. Uh, for example, we found where there are, is an uh, uh, area where uh, certain beneficiaries are receiving unemployment and disability insurance at the same time, and so the federal government's replacing lost revenue twice, uh, and this could be uh, rectified through change in law, uh, and also in tax collections. We uh, have recommendations where you know, we found a lot of people who have passports, 1% of the people who had passports when we looked at it have $5.8 billion in delinquent taxes. And if we decided that you can't have a passport unless you pay your taxes, uh, CBO estimates we could save $500 million a year over a five-year period of time. And we have other uh, areas where we think delinquent taxes could be collected. So the bottom line is, uh, you know, some good progress has been made. Uh, where there have been big progress, though, it's taken the Congress to pass the legislation. In most of these areas where we cite savings, it took congressional action 
uh, to really achieve those savings, uh, even though the agencies were moving in the right direction. So I would encourage this committee and the Congress as a whole to continue to you know, focus on these areas, and I think we'll be a more efficient and effective government as a result. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, the, the committee. I appreciate being here today.